everyone, welcome back. I'm Dr. Rupa. I'm an ophthalmologist, specifically a pediatric ophthalmologist, and today I'm so excited. I have been waiting for this forever. I get to do a Doctor Reacts to the Good Doctor, and everyone's been talking about the show and how great it is. But unfortunately, I guess ophthalmologists don't do sexy enough things for medical dramas. It's because maybe to outsiders, our surgeries are not that exciting, and no one's coding, no one's dying. We are saving vision, so I think it's pretty amazing. But today, we are doing season three, episode seven of The Good Doctor, because as I was looking through the spoilers, I saw that they're talking about a kid that's going to be going blind, and that's right up my alley as a pediatric ophthalmologist. So let's get started. Before we get started, I'd love it if you hit that bell notification, like the video, and subscribe to my channel. So, all right, let's go. We do a complete enucleation of the right eye, then replace it with the temporary implant, and in a few weeks you'll You know why blind people don't skydive? It scares the hell out of the dog. Let the doctors finish, okay, bud? Yeah, cancer eye out, fake eye in. Just like last time I got it. So he has eye cancer and given his age, I'm assuming that it is a type of cancer called retinoblastoma. It's the most common intraocular cancer in children. And it actually has very good survival rates, 95% survival rates, because they do exactly what they did in his other eye case where they enucleate or remove the eyeball. It's the type of cancer that happens in the retina. So what you do is you remove the eyeball and you want to be able to get a part of the optic nerve also, and that prevents it from extending and penetrating into the brain. So it seems like that's what he had done on the other side. He looks a little bit old, to be honest. Usually kids that have retinoblastoma, it's diagnosed around ages two through eight years old. Um, so he's definitely a little bit on the older side to have this. And the other thing is it can be genetic. So 50% of the time, it's an autosomal dominant condition. You get it from one of your parents. Half the time it's sporadic, meaning you can just have it. So the retinoblastoma gene, it's on chromosome 13. What it does is a tumor suppressor gene. So it suppresses the proliferation of tumors. And if you don't have it, then you can develop retinoblastoma and sometimes even a third type of cancer, which is a pineoloma. Um, and so these kids are just more at risk for developing all sorts of cancers. In the old days, they would do a lot of radiation treatment for them also. Where I trained um, for medical school at Cornell is associated with Memorial Sloan Kettering. And there's a group there that's like top for retinoblastoma. So they would do these retinoblastoma clinics where every um, week on a certain day, they would just examine all the kids for retinoblastoma, you know, because you want to check them every six months, every year, making sure that the tumor, if they have a tumor in the other eye, it's not growing so big because usually you want to be able to preserve the vision in at least one eye so that children don't end up going blind. So I'm not sure what his situation is here why he has to have the other eye also enucleated from the cancer if they tried these other treatment modalities and they didn't work or what because usually they won't enucleate both eyes or it's really just kind of a last resort because we don't want to leave kids blind check it out even moves and everything can't even tell it's fake very cool like a bionic superhero yeah my superpower is Tripping over stuff. What time is the surgery? Three o'clock. Which means I've got six hours left to blast some aliens. So they don't really talk about if he's had other kinds of treatments. Um, what they've developed in about the last 10 years are a couple different things. We call them globe sparing because you wanna to try to keep the eyeball, at least one good eyeball. If you have to remove one for the retinoblastoma, then we try to just typically shrink the tumor down in the other eye just so that the person can have vision. There is something called ophthalmic artery chemosurgery where they will inject chemotherapy directly into the artery of the eye. And there's ultra also 
intravitreal injections. And the vitreous is the jelly of your eye. It occupies about 80% of the volume of your eye. I think of it like a big jello. And they will inject inside the eye. Intravitreal injections are also what they do for people with macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. So they've developed it as well for retinoblastoma that's seeded into the vitreous. So they've done intravitreal injections with good success as well as the um, ophthalmic artery chemo surgery. So I don't know if he had those and he failed or what happened, but I feel really bad for him because it is hard. It's really hard and it's hard as a parent. And I've done these surgeries in the past where I've had to remove the eye. And the reason that the prosthetic eye can move so well is that you take the eye, but you leave the extraocular muscles, you leave the muscles of the eye, and then you put in a prosthetic. Well, first you put in a little implant and you stitch the muscles. It's kind of made out of hydroxyapatite or different kinds of things. You stitch the muscles to it so that the implant can move. And then you get a prosthetic shell made to cover it. And that they'll do an amazing job. You, they will actually, sometimes you have a really hard time recognizing if it's a fake eye or not. I remember like in residency, you have to really put them in the slit lamp because they will hand paint them. They custom match the colors. When we used to do these surgeries a lot in Boston, we would have the ocularist, who is the person that does these prosthetics, come into the operating room with us, and then they would do a lot of the preliminary measurements so that we could get, you know, because there's all different sizes, and they want to be able to make something that matches and just that, that at least the child doesn't feel as self-conscious, because they've done a lot of studies, and even as adults, a lot of these patients feel extremely self-conscious and it affects them psychosocially with all sorts of other things and have just one eye. So that's a little background on the prosthetic, but let's see what happens to him. Maybe they come up with the one of the other treatments so that they can save his vision. would you have faced going blind with humor, uh, maturity, and acceptance? I would have burned things down. He's dealing with it in his own way. We'll check in with him while you're taking care of the rest of the paperwork. Make sure Charlie knows there's people he can talk to. Thank you. Dr. Resnick, take Charlie's blood to the lab. Dr. Brown, talk to him. Maybe he'll open up to you. Usually in situations like this, they won't just have the physician talking to the patient. They'll also have a social worker or a psychiatrist because it's a lot to deal with. So I'm surprised. I don't know. Is she a psychiatrist or a psychologist? I don't know. Doesn't seem like it. Perhaps she is. Let's find out. How'd you talk to Charlie though? She wants to be left alone. No, he wanted to be left alone. And yet here we are. Precocious preteen going blind. Come on, that's Claire Catnip. You have to talk to him. Uh -oh. Did he have any tests at all? No. So he's gone. Um, is it easy for a kid to just get up and walk out of the hospital? Yeah, I guess so, maybe, um, if he's old enough and they don't have those kind of bracelets on him which would trigger sensors. I think most of them in most children's hospitals, most of the patients will have the ID bands which have a little locator chip so that it gets triggered. So I don't, I don't think he could just get up and walk away. No one would know where he is. At least, um, let's take a look and see. So you could see from his eye that it was bloodshot, which is called subconjunctival hemorrhage. And usually that happens in trauma. In his case, he has it because of the tumor causing a little bit of bleeding or the blood vessels get really, really fragile. Perhaps he's tri already had the intravitreal injection and the injection could have left that little spot of blood. So, But oftentimes with retinoblastoma, the eye 
otherwise looks fine. It's not like it grows really abnormally large. It's the reason that your pediatricians do that red reflex test. And it's why when you take pictures with a camera flash, if one of the eyes, instead of getting a red reflex back, looks white, that's called leukocoria. And that's one of the signs of retinoblastoma because the tumor is really white and it fills up the entire eye. And that's what you're concerned about when you see that white reflex. There's other causes um, that for a leukocoria like strabismus or unequal refractive error like asymmetric glasses prescription. But leukocoria and retinoblastoma, they're kind of the hallmark and it's what everybody gets really scared when they see and when they Google it, you find retinoblastoma. So um, that's kind of what something that you would see maybe, but again, not externally. So usually if they have retinoblastoma, you wouldn't see a subconjunctival hemorrhage unless I guess it's maybe way advanced or he's had some kind of treatment. Crazy? I was asking her that earlier. Tell her you think she's the most beautiful girl you've ever laid eyes on, and with your last few hours of sight, you wanted to see her face one more time. That's really hard. I'm getting very teary-eyed. Um, I think it's just, it's very hard because he is cognizant as to what's going on. Like I said, most of the time these kids are younger. And so he did mention it's been three years, five months. So he's had retinoblastoma for some time. So they must have tried all of these other globe sparing, globe saving treatments and it didn't work. So he's at, you know, the end of the road with that eye. And so now they have to enucleate it to be able to save his life. Um, but it's hard because not that it's easy when it's any child, but especially when it's a child that's this age that understands what's going on, but then is just not in control of the situation. Situation sucks and it is unfair, but you know what? Life sucks and it's unfair and things end before we're ready. Not the way I would talk to any patient and certainly not to a pediatric patient who is about to undergo this extremely life-changing surgery. That shows no compassion at all. That's terrible. I'm not gonna have the surgery. Since he's a minor, he can't actually say he's not gonna have a surgery. The parents technically can get him to have the surgery, but on our consent forms, if the child is over 12, or even if I can have a discussion, I always want the children to be a part of the conversation. And I actually will have them sign the consent form, not legally binding, but it's their body. And I want them to understand if we're doing eye muscle surgery or if we're doing cataract surgery, you know, and if they can understand the discussion when I'm going through the consent, I ask them to sign it too. They should be able to participate in the decision-making regarding their bodies. Um, he's at danger, which he would be because the cancer will spread to the brain through the optic nerve and kill him. So the parents can absolutely elect to have the surgery even against his will because it's life-threatening. We're running a little late and we need to get you prepped. Pretty sure that he was drinking slushies at that baseball game because of the cute girl. Uh, you usually have to be NPO or nothing by mouth for surgery because this surgery is done under general anesthesia. Um, so we don't want a child or an adult waking up as we're removing the eyeball. So typically you have to be nothing by mouth for um, at least eight hours. So it doesn't seem like it's been eight hours. I don't think they would prep him for surgery this day. They would likely, if this was real, delay it till the next day. Maybe he didn't drink the slushies. I don't know. You ready? She's about to cry. I'm crying now. But the first one of these that I did, um, gosh, now about 15 years ago when I was in Boston, and I still remember the little boy, um, and we wheeled him in. And at, at Children's Hospital, you the parent can come with them, especially if they're quite young, into the operating room just so that they're calmer. And the father, he like was holding it together, and they put the mask, and they put the, the baby out to sleep. And I, I must have been the fellow. I was the fellow at the time. 
Um, and I, he just lost it. Like I had to walk him out and he just like started sobbing. And then I just like her, you know, was like so close to crying too, but I needed to assist in this surgery with my attending surgeon. It's just, yeah, this, this disease gets me and it's, it's hard. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> Obviously, probably violating a ton of rules, but that's funny and sweet. Yeah. Is okay. Tap might be a little loud, but he's ready now. <laughs> you did so good. We're so proud of you, buddy. Charlie? Dr. Resnick, how are you feeling? Not awesome. Are you in any pain? No. Thank you so much for everything. You're welcome. I, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I think that most of it's definitely with, regarding the retinoblastoma case. They patched and shielded the eye properly. I think most of it what they were discussing was very accurate. I think the inter-hospital romance aspect is also pretty accurate. There's very subtle nuances of working with your significant other, whether you're in a dating relationship or married. Um, and there's differences with being in clinic versus being a surgeon too. And I think that was highlighted really well. So I think I'm gonna keep watching. Let me know if there's some that I should check out if there happens to be an ophthalmology one or my other area of expertise is dating, dating in the hospital that, um, I mean, I didn't date a ton, I'm just saying, because again, where else are you except for working? So anyway, hope you guys liked it. This was fun, I enjoyed it. And subscribe, like, do all of that, and I will see you soon. I am Dr. Rupa, mahalo for watching.